So this session is on is called passing on the tradition, learning old Irish heart repertory style and technique. And so I thought a thing that I've been working on for the last few years is all to do with where you get your ideas from, basically. So a lot of a lot of what we talk about in classes and everything is what is what you do with the with the with the ideas that are in your mind. Okay, you get given manuscript pages and you get taught a lot about how to apply them, how to play the harp and all that kind of thing. And so what I'm digging at is the earlier in that process, where do these ideas come from? And I did a talk last year at Skoll, and it's on YouTube, so you can go and look at it, all about tradition and lineage, because I found in a, a book about Welsh harp tradition, the idea of a lineage of where they got their tradition from. And these Welsh harpists who are alive today writing books can trace their lineage, their teacher, and who they were taught by, and who they were taught by, and who they were taught by, all the way back to the 18th century and before. And I thought that was so cool and very exciting. And we can't do that because the whole nature of the early Irish harp tradition is that it, there is not a continuing living tradition of early Irish harp playing. So this chart here shows you what I think is the longest unbroken chain of tradition of transmission that I've been able to find. Okay. And I've put, and I've given you pictures of some of the people. So can you see Arthur O'Neill is a kind of central figure in this chart. Arthur O'Neill is a very important harper. He's the man who dictated his autobiography for one of Edward Bunting's secretaries. So you can read Arthur O'Neill's book where he tells the story of his life as an Irish harper on the road in the 18th century. And Arthur O'Neill tells us in his autobiography that he was taught by Owen Keenan, who was born about 1725. So here's Arthur sitting with his harp under a tree. So Arthur O'Neill learned from Owen Keenan. We don't know who Owen Keenan learned the harp from, but there must have been somebody. Owen Keenan's master is off the top of the screen. Now, Arthur O'Neill, when he was an old man, was employed by the harp societies in Belfast. And some of the students at the harp societies, so Valentine Rennie was one of them. This is Valentine Rennie here. Edward McBride was another, and there were loads of other students as well who went to the Belfast Harp Society. A lot of them didn't do very well. Some of them were instantly dismissed because they were incapable of playing the harp. It was a bit of hit and miss. But Valentine Rennie and Edward McBride, these were like star students of Arthur O'Neill. And so Valentine Rennie, I think for a while he went to Dublin and he, and he did harp there and he came back and he became master of the harp society in Belfast and he taught James Jackson and James Jackson became master of the society after Valentine Rennie died and he taught other students okay. but none of these had any, did any teaching so that's why there's no line beneath them it doesn't go any further the other students didn't, there's no line there Edward Edward McBride, he had two famous students. One of them was Patrick Byrne, who was photographed. This is the photograph of Patrick Byrne. Okay, he toured around a lot, went to Scotland, England. The other student that Edward McBride taught was Hugh Fraser. And Hugh Fraser became master of the Drogheda Harp Society. And he taught boys to play the harp in Drogheda. And his most notable student was William Griffith. And here's William Griffith sitting playing the harp at a big political rally in, about eight, in the 1840s. Okay. And other Drogheda students. But none of them had any students. So you see that this lineage comes all the way down and it comes to an end. And there were no students after that, so there was no transmission of lineage after that. The tradition came to an end. Yeah? And this is our problem, is that we, we cannot connect up into that. 
is why we're doing the work that we're doing here. But this is an important concept. You can see that the, tr the, the lineage of transmission coming down and stopping. You could be a little bit subtle and say that actually all this stuff is kind of not quite the real deal. Arthur Vanille was the real deal. He was taught in the old tradition. He went out and found a harper to be his mentor and master and did an apprenticeship. But all these others were done by charitable societies after the harp tradition was really about dead. And they were doing it as a kind of charitable thing, teaching blind, poor, blind boys. They didn't necessarily want to learn the harp. So you could even say that all of this stuff is after the end of the old tradition. Maybe this is the final end. But I'm including this because it is a genuine lineage of, tra of transmission, which is what I'm interested in. Okay. So Arthur O'Neill. So why is the tradition broken in this way? You've got two big plates. You've got the end of the old tradition, and then you've got this society attempt to keep it going, but it doesn't carry on. And what's going on here? And so this is where we have to look wider at what's happening in society. And there is big connections. Eamon O'Royer did a lecture at Skoll two years ago, which is on YouTube, where he talked about Anglo and Irish aspects of tradition in Ireland. And he talked about the Irish language poets and the harpers, and he talked about the English-speaking aristocracy, gentry, the people in the big houses, the music collectors. So Bunting very much fits onto the Anglo side of things. Bunting didn't speak Irish. He, he was he's a classical musician. And yet the harpers did speak Irish, they're in the native tradition. And so you have this Anglo and Irish thing going on. Okay? And it's connect this the end of these traditions is connected to the decline of the Irish language. Really. I mean it's shocking. We all come to Ireland and study the Irish harp and we all speak English. I mean if we went to England and studied the English harp, then we would understand all the lessons being done in English. But why in Ireland studying the Irish harp are we not speaking Irish? The Irish language just got lost. They're trying to revive it yeah. now as well. But, but did it get lost, or was it? Was it the victim of yeah, it was the victim. An, yeah, an, an, a kind of aggressive colonial it. political yeah. thing? So there really was this colonial takeover of Irish culture by Anglo culture, and it comes in lots of different ways. Um, and the language issue is the best way to see it. Now the Irish language is not dead, okay, but the Irish harp tradition is. Okay, you could draw a lineage of Irish language, and people people learn it from their mammies, don't they? But you could, but you, so it's this, so, that, so a, a, a lineage of tradition of speaking the Irish language is basically the same as your family tree. And you can trace it all the way back up to generations. But learning the harp is not, because most people don't learn the harp from their mammy when they're a baby. They go to a harp teacher and learn it from a master. So, that, so there's an interesting difference here between family trees. And so that's why I think the language can survive, even though it's massively squashed and marginalised, but the harp tradition that can't. It just can't manage it. And I think, I think that all of this, all of these people were learning the harp through English language. I think, I don't know, there might have been some Irish language tuition here. Certainly some of, Patrick Byrne was a native Irish speaker and he only learned English at the age of 11 or so, I think. But I suspect that there, there might be a lot of English language speaking here. I think there was classical music teaching methods in these societies. And again, that's what I feel on the side. Arthur O'Neill, I'm sure he learned through the medium of Irish language. I'm sure. So, this whole cultural political thing, we've got to be aware of it. We've got to deal with it in our own heads. You know, what are we doing? What, what side are we on politically, if you like? It's, it's, like? it's one of those political questions where you can't really be neutral because it really affects what you do in your heart and what your whole approach to things is. Mm -hmm. 
Normally I print out a little little chart for myself of what slides are coming next, and I haven't, so I have no idea what the next slide is, so we'll have to see what comes up. Okay, so this fits exactly with what I was just saying about. I realised that you could take that... Eamon had a wonderful chart on one of his slides two years ago, and he put Irish language on the left and English language on the right, and he, drew, and he wrote on the chart who was doing what where, so harpers, poets, bunting, collectors, put, put them on a different side. And I thought, you could do the same thing with the harp traditions. And then once I did it, I realised it was kind of stereotyped in its simplicity. And I have this sheet here with this same image on, so you can have to squint at the screen if you want. You can, you can put it in your phone and think about it. So the idea of this sheet is it divides, it, it shows you, it's the same limit, lineage idea, but here instead of individuals learning from their teachers, this gives you general, broad stereotypes. And this is deliberately crude and simple. Okay, there's nothing subtle and nuanced about this chart, which means it's probably completely wrong, but it's a tool to think about things. And what I've done is here's, here's, the, night, here's the Heart Society schools I just showed you, and here's, so, so that was like Edward McBride, Valentine, many, they were, uh, uh, Patrick Byrne, they were all on this level, and they came to a full stop to show you that they didn't have any, any they didn't pass the tradition on. And then up the next level, here's Arthur O'Neill and Owen Keenan, they're on this level. And the next level up is who they learned from, Caroline is on this level, because he's a few generations early. And here's where they got their stuff from, the late medieval Gallic harp traditions in Ireland and Scotland. The people playing on the Trinity College harp and the Queen Mary harp, the accompanying the bardic poetry in the, in the Gallic royal courts. And they got their tradition from prehistoric and early medieval, presumably, and it's in italics to show you it's getting a bit vague and it get, kind of gets lost in the mists of time. And you can't really trace the lineage back that far. Does that make sense? Do, do you think that's plausible, vaguely plausible, that that's where those traditions come from? And then, here is contemporary Irish and Scottish harp traditions. This is the lever harp stuff. This is the kind of thing you get at the flower and the majority of people playing the harp in Ireland today, all the harp island crowd, all that kind of stuff, they're doing contemporary Irish and Scottish harp traditions. And they're active and alive and nurturing new people, and so that's why I put, they've got a future of passing on. And I'm tracing them back, and I'm thinking, where does that music come from? Well, it's 1970s folk revivals. Think of Alison Kinnair in Scotland. Think of Mary O'Hara here in Ireland. And they're getting their, their learning from people in the 19th and early 20th century Gallic revivals, the invention of the fish and the movement here, and the mod in Scotland, and the, that, that big Gallic revival of 100, 120 years ago, and earlier, back into the 19th century. And that, those traditions get all of their playing technique, instrument construction, all that kind of thing comes from English and French pedal harp. The lever harp, the modern Irish harp, is basically a shrunken single action pedal harp with its gut strings, its colours, its semitone mechanisms, the right orientation, all this kind of thing. Yeah? And English and French pedal harp traditions come from Renaissance and Baroque German harpers originally. So pedal harps come out of Germany, out of Bohemia, that kind of area. And that, and that descends from medieval harp traditions across Europe, in Italy, in France, in Germany, in Eastern Europe. And that comes out of the ancient world, early medieval continental string movements, which go back to the mists of time. Does that make sense? Okay. And then you realise that there's no crossover at all. Is there any way, possibility that perhaps they coexisted, you know, crossovers exactly? Well, of course it's possible. But, the, but, but, but I want to say, if so, where, how much? Okay. So you can, you can draw dotted lines. So maybe medieval harpers across Europe yeah. had some influence, in, or maybe these had influence. Or maybe the pedal harp people had influence on the harp societies. Or, but if the, and of course, there's always connections. Everything's connected to everything else. You know, there were, there were Jesuits who went to Japan and brought back Japanese music. But that doesn't mean that you can't do this crude stereotype. These are the main cultural trends. 
Like, if you took Irish language and English language, of course there were borrowings between them. In English, we always say, that's smashing. And that's an Irish language, the borrowing from Irish. But that doesn't mean that English and Irish are intermixed. They're separate languages. And so the same thing here. These are separate traditions, as far as I can see. Yeah, that's a very important point. We, we know that, um, uh, that the Irish harvest travelled in, in Europe. Yes. And, and were noticed. And yeah. they turned turn up in, in the poetry. But they were identified as Irish. Oh, right? absolutely. Yeah. And so, so this is what I'm saying, is that there's, there's constantly little, little wisps of yeah. smoke going between these two. Well. But that doesn't stop the main thrust of the lineage. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Good. Uh, I, I, I'd be interested if you spoke the idea of the, the conflict of languages and its political implications. I'd like just to see if you developed that. Oh, I've developed it. Yeah. Language is always political. Oh, precisely. I mean, um, the, 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 the Germanic English yes. is what drove the, the, what the Britonic language was into Wales and Cornwall, yes. and we accept that. Um, that is how we know the, 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 the English, if you like. One, because they won through language, yeah, and I accept that. And how do you see that as a development? How do you see that developing now? You say it's a political point, which I accept. How do you see that? Where do you see that going now? Where do you see it going? Well, your personal choice about what language you speak. Well, with respect. We, 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 make, a personal, we, make, a, we make a political choice here at Skoll to run the sessions in English. And there's a good argument that this is a mistake, that this is a political mistake, we should be running the classes all in Irish. But, but actually, you, you don't have to, I mean, I, you're a native English speaker. Yes. I, mean, I speak and learn English. Well, I'm foreign, aren't I? I'm not Irish. No, 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 precisely. But I mean, where, where does that leave the individual in all this? Well, the individual has to make hard choices. Yeah. The individual, where does this leave the individual? What I'm doing here is I'm just showing off what, where, what traditions there are, where they come from, and it's up to the individual to position themselves in that scene. Okay? There are plenty of people who play modern Irish harp with levers, etc., etc., and they're clearly here, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with being there. There's nothing wrong with playing pedal harp. There's nothing wrong with playing uh, ukulele and being over here in a completely different tradition. Okay? There's nothing wrong with wherever you position yourself. But what, I, what I'm interested in is, I just want to know what people are doing, why they're doing it, where they're getting it from. Okay. And it especially interests me if people do one thing and claim to be doing another thing. That's, that's the most interesting. Okay. So, <laughs> so my question on my sheet, how do we get things going again? Okay, we've talked about how the early Irish art tradition is a dead tradition. It does not have a continuing lineage of transmission. Okay, we can't go to the person who studied from a person who studied from a person who studied from a person who studied with Arthur O'Neill. If we could, sort it. You just go to them and do what they tell you to. We can't do that because they all died 150 years ago. We didn't leave any. Successes. Okay. So if you like, we we want to be there. Okay. But we can't just turn up there because there's no there's no thing hanging down for us to attach to. Okay, we want to be there. And I think there's a We could, we could just sit here, okay? This is a line, it has a future, we could just sit here. Okay? But I guess that's the point of Skoll and the Glasgow, is that we're not happy being here. We don't, we don't think this is, a, this is a place to be if we're interested in all this stuff, okay? What we want to do is we want to be here. And so we're trying to invent methods for bridging this gap. And people have done that a lot for a long time. They've tried to invent methods of bridging that gap. And in the past, a lot of those methods involve saying, well, we're here. Well, let's go along to here, and let's climb up and hope that there's a vague... Yeah, 
process of creation. Yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe after that. yeah. Okay. And then I don't think it works like that because if you go along here, you're on that highway. Okay. It does. It doesn't go like that. Okay. And no amount of wishful thinking will make it go like that. So I think I think this route is not it's not gonna, it's not working. Okay, it's been done a lot from the early nineteenth century through to the early twentieth century. And I'll talk a little bit about this, I think, in my talk in a few days' time. I don't know, maybe I won't. So that's not working. So we need other strategies. Okay. And so I, c I come, my, my training is as an archaeologist, and I was also interested in ethnology, and I, and I thought about that and how that relates to music, and there are connections with ethnomusicology and all these kind of things. But basically, as an archaeologist, you study the rubbish of the distant past, and you try and piece together fragments to build up a picture of what life was like. And I thought, well, you can do the same thing in music, okay? So, that, so, so that, that kind of approach says, okay, so we're here, we can't go directly to there, but what we need is lots of bits of rubbish, and then we can stitch them all together to build up a picture of what life is like. Now, the way archaeology works is it's a scientific subject. You piece together as much rubbish as you can, and you build like a, a vague picture of what life was like. But you always have to look out for a new rubbish pit. Okay? And there's nothing archaeologists love better than finding a rubbish pit that's never been opened before, opening it up, pulling all the rubbish out, and then changing their idea of what life was like. Okay? So this is the key to any kind of scientific approach to knowledge, is that what you really want is to find new information that proves you wrong. And then you change your idea, and then you know that you've you, your ideas are better now than they were before you found this new thing out. Okay? So, so we're always looking for a new piece of information that proves that we're wrong. Okay? So I'd love to find a piece of information that says, actually, no, there's a, there's a direct connection from here to Caroline. That'd be really cool, because then I could say this is wrong and I could make a new chart that's better. Okay? So I'm actively looking for that kind of thing, and I'm not finding it yet, but... And I want to. Okay. So the first thing I think we start with, I've made you some handouts. Okay. A lot of the classes here to do with tunes, repertory, that kind of thing. But I'm thinking let's be a bit more abstract here. So this handout takes portraits of old harpers. Okay. And I've clipped these portraits down to show their hands. Okay. And what I'm thinking is what criteria do we use to know how to place our hands on the strings? Does anyone have any suggestions of how you go around placing your hands on the strings of your harp? What principles would you use? I just start with the strings. Yeah, you start with the strings and you start with your hands. And then how do you, how do you think? What, sh what do I do with my hands? And I, my suggestion is, we have portraits of what are... Here's a picture of Arthur O'Neill with his hands on the harp. Now, if you went to study with a, a student of Arthur O'Neill, they would just tell you how to put your hands on the harp. You can't because they're all dead. But here's an actual picture of Arthur O'Neill. So maybe you should do what he's doing. Does that, would that be a sensible way to connect into his tradition? Okay. Yeah. You're not certain? Well, no, because, you know, it's a picture, and we don't know, maybe it was just stylized. Maybe okay. just well, that's why I've given you six pictures. Yeah. Okay. And these are all my different artists of different harpers at different times. And so maybe then we can start looking for things that are constants between yeah. the pictures. Because you're quite right, there could be anything wrong with any of these pictures, but if you see something that's common to, all, to a lot of them, then you start thinking, no, no, it's not even that it must be, but maybe there's something going on. And the way we can do this as well is I've got more. Here's another one.
pictures of the world. And this is all I've got. And this is all of the pictures that I've been able to find in total of hands of old harpers. I haven't yet found any more. Actually, that's not quite true. There's one or two more portraits, but they're kind of duplicates. So there's two other sketches of Arthur and Neil that are obviously copied from the same portrait. So they're giving us new information. Okay, there's an important point about these four <coughs> sheets. Give me two here, Simon. There's an important point about these four sheets, and that is one sheet, this sheet, is entirely pictures of Patrick Byrne, and he's here. Okay. And another sheet, this one, is entirely pictures of Patrick Murney, and I think he must be here. Okay, so what's the common thing about those two sheets? Patrick, what's the common what's the common factor between Patrick Byrne and Patrick Murney? Well, let's have a melody for something. But I mean, not, without even looking at the picture, the common thing about those two is that they're below this line. They're in the revival already. Okay. Whereas all the, the other two sheets are all people up in the real old tradition. So, well, we can look for things that are common to all the sheets, and we can look for things that are different between the, the two Patricks and the two other sheets. So Bob has just raised a very interesting point. Every single one has left hand in the treble and right hand in the bass. Every single one. Okay. Is there any reason not to, for us not to do that? Fact that we play on the right side and not on the left Is side. Is there any reason for us to, to do the opposite of what these old players are doing? Not really, it's just because we were taught to do it on the right side. Okay. So we, we were on that where, side. Where does, the, where does the idea of doing it that way around come from? Okay. If you play with it, if you play with your right hand high and your left hand low, you're saying, yeah. look at me, I'm here. I'm here. Okay? Yeah. It's part of a package that's on this side. Okay. Whereas those pictures clearly show, if you want to be over there, here's a thing that everybody on that side does. That is the opposite from what everyone on this side does. Okay. So can you really get yourself over there by doing that? It's just a question. I'm not, I have no answers. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm only asking you a question. Okay. What else can you see? Let's go around the room. Bob Startage, favourite. Ava, tell us something that you can see in those pictures. Just anything you, that strikes you. Anything at all. Hand position. Hand position. Okay, tell us about the hand position. What do you see? Um, that sometimes bent um, over the street and over the base hand with the Open position. Okay, so Ava's, so, so are you seeing a difference between the hands? Yeah. Okay, so Ava's saying there's a difference between the hands. And the left hand in the treble is, show us what you're seeing. Show us with your left hand what you're seeing. Which one? Any of them. Any of them. Well, the hand is bent. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, so, so this kind of shape. And they're all slightly different, aren't they? Yeah, there is uh, one of um, Arthur and me, I think, that is a little bent uh, down. Yeah, here. like almost like this. Yeah, yeah. like the, yeah. the position in a modern Irish yeah. heart yeah. and. Um, yeah, look at it down. Interesting point. Interesting point. Um, have a look at the pictures of Patrick Byrne and Patrick Murney. They're, they're different, aren't they? Yeah. So, so both their hands are turned down more so like this. Yeah. Okay. I think that this is similar to modern pedal harp technique. You say modern Irish harp technique. Yeah. But where does modern Irish harp technique it's, come from? It's similar. Celtic, um, and this is 
it's not really similar, it comes from the yeah, some as follows. Yeah. So, so this makes me think, uh, Patrick Byrne and Patrick Murray, they've got pedal harp influence onto them, okay? Could be. But then Arthur O'Neill is doing a bit of this with his left hand, so maybe he's already picking up. Maybe Arthur O'Neill is already sniffing at this side. I don't know. But that's good. Well, one must accept that the people sounds aren't all the same. Well, no. Yeah. But you can see that in the pictures, that everybody's hand is a bit different. Yeah. But we're looking for a general overall principle. Okay. So, so does, does this, is this a nice idea that when we're playing the harp, we should, think, we should look at these pictures and we should make our hands these kind of shapes. And if our hands are wildly different shapes, that doesn't, that's not helping us get into the old position. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just want to make the point that I think it depends also what perhaps you're playing that particular point. So if you've got an ounce's hands here, and um, where um, the, 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 the other one yeah. um, uh, what, what is required to do at that point for the, for, in the pose or whatever? And it, it involves the thumb and the first two fingers. Arthur O'Neill has got the, the, the extended fourth finger uh, for, for another purpose. It's the opposite hand. Yeah, I, I accept that too. Well, Ava said this about the hands, so, so, so actually comparing these two hands is not necessarily useful because this is his treble hand, this is his bass hand. Precisely. So compare the bass hands together. Uh, I accept that, but just supposing that um, on the treble hand at that point was required to stretch an octave, which is good, he would have to do what he's doing with his right hand there. Right. With his left hand. Okay. We've, we've and, do you see, and do you see a picture of anybody doing that? Well, perhaps it wasn't required in the music. Yeah, it wasn't. But then, but if it wasn't, then if that wasn't the common thing required in the music, that's interesting. That tells us something about the music. Well, it also tells us something about iconography. Um, it does. I mean, it tells us, you know, so take, 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 taking the, the archaeological point. I mean, the picture is drawn at a certain point. Certain so, point. So, 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 if, so, if you're not happy with this information, what, where are you going to get more from? I think the information is great. I just don't think we're going to play as evidence. That's the point. Ooh, but bear in mind that. So what other evidence do we have? Well, we, uh, that is the pre precise point that it's not it, that it's not a, a it's not a blind alley, but neither is it a, a clear alley. Okay. okay. I want. I just want to. I just want to look at what there is. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Again, this is the thing archaeologists do. You look at what there is, and if there's absence of evidence, you acknowledge that. Yes. Okay. And what you try not to do is just really nearly pull in ideas out of your head, because ideas in your head do not come from nowhere. Okay, they come from the world around you. And the world around us is not the world of the old Gallic learned orders. The world around us is the world of American TV and mass consumer culture. Even if we live in a hole in the ground in the countryside, we're still, our heads are still filled with American no, TV no. and mass culture. It's, it's terrifying. So anyway, so. I'm trying to escape that and try and get to the real deal. Simon, yes, I was going to ask you next. Say, tell me something. No, um, the, the hands are down. Yes. Very good. So, they, so do they all have their hands low on the, no. on the half? Yes. Yeah. I think you're right. And the, and the ones that don't, Patrick Byrne, his hands are quite up, but he's got that pedal half thing going on. So I think you're right. In the old tradition, they're all really quite low on the half. It's almost like they're, they're pressing their hands onto the same board. Yes, but I feel more relaxed if my hands are down. Yeah. Or not. Okay. Because if I have a okay. I have to stay in yeah. this position, yeah. very mm, okay. not natural position. Yeah. And if you go down, the, yeah. maybe you feel more relaxed. Yeah. Although, well, there's any number of reasons. We can do whatever we like. I said that. We, we could all stop playing the harp and play ukulele if we wanted to. So we can do whatever we like. But if, if we want to get position ourselves over here and connect with these guys, it's, then is how relaxed we feel a part of that? Do, does our own personal feelings feed into that? Possibly not. You know? Perhaps it's a convenient extra. But... Perhaps we have to, you know, I think, I think in the old days they were quite strict. Um, there's a way to do things. Um, I don't know, I'm just 
just thinking. These are all good thoughts. Do you have anything to say from the pictures? Um, anything that you can see? I was just wondering, how, is the tones in different positions, like in some photos they're kind of more upwards and some of them more curved? Yeah. Or maybe that's just the way they're painted? Yeah, I don't really know. And it's really hard in the pictures to see whether the thumb is on the string or off the string. You can't really tell that. So, I don't know about the thumbs. This goes back to what Bob, uh, Bob was saying, that everybody's hands are a different shape. Everybody has, and thumbs especially, are different. Mm -hmm. so, but you can still start, start thinking, they all have their thumbs kind of up. There's nobody with their thumbs down like this in these pictures. Yeah? They're all doing a kind of thumb over kind of thing. May I just say, when we know that in the European tradition, I mean, in the Lutheran and the Harpo, the thumb is sometimes used to under, pass under, well, that's here, isn't it? Yes. yes. So you're interested in what's happening here? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't very much anymore, although we can't tell the course. No. But it's interesting to me that, that there's no hint of thumb under in these pictures. It's all, it's all up. It's either up on the string or up out the way. Sometimes it's quite close to the image. Are you seeing that in these pictures? Which, which picture are you seeing that in? Yeah, so that's his right hand. His thumb is quite low, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. Not easy to see his right hand because it's a bit no. behind the strings, but you're right. So that's one instance where maybe he's got to expect the thumb. Okay. Louisa, have you got anything to say about the pictures? Yes, well, yes. <laughs> Go for it. Okay, sure. So I was thinking, so regarding the uh, base hand. Yes. Okay, the baseline and all that stuff. Most of it we, we don't have because, you know, when bunting microscopes were done all that yeah. stuff, we mostly just wrote the treble hand and stuff like that. But I'm thinking perhaps by the way all of sort of the um, base hand, they sort of all have this, this ripper finger that's going... The fourth finger sticking out. Yeah, yeah, exactly, sticking out. Then perhaps up, up till then the, the base was still there and maybe exactly there's some sort of in common, yeah. perhaps. So yeah, so this is important, this base hand shape, that there is a consistency, there that the hand is spread out. Um, and I did a little project with Patrick Byrne, and it's less relevant to studying the older stuff, because he's got pedal half stuff going on, but I tried to count the strings on his harp and work out what strings is he put his fingers on. Exactly. And he's basically placing in a kind of chord shape. So he's put his fingers on useful strings that he's going to use, yeah. and then that gives you an idea of of perhaps what the base could have been because yeah. this is yeah. you know already it's it's yeah. not it's it's quite yeah. mod modern. Yeah. So, it's, so if you're inventing a base, you maybe you want maybe you should think of inventing a base that uses those kind of strings and that kind of hand position rather than a base that uses a sort of smaller a smaller or a classical or anything like that. Yeah. So these are these are interesting ideas. What I want to do very briefly is come out a little bit of some of these pictures. I think these pictures are so important because they're a different kind of resource from the manuscripts and the notations. Okay. So here's the portrait of Arthur O'Neill. Here he is. Here's his right hand with his fourth finger stretched out. Here's his left hand all curled up with his thumb. And he's sitting at his harp. And we don't actually know what harp Arthur O'Neill has, but I looked through and I thought, well, where is Mooney's harp? It's the same kind of size. Okay. Well, the master's a bit bigger. So what I think wanted us to do next is we've got two rose minis here, and so we're going to pass them around the room, and you can all sit like Arthur and Neil. Okay. So what I want us to do is just, just try it. So take the half, look at him, and you sit with it, and you think, like, I want to seat this kind of high. My knees are like a little bit in front. I put my right hand on my knee. Is that fair? I should do the other way so you can see. So do I put my right hand on my knee or a little bit above it? And where's my wrist? It's kind of back against the soundboard. And my fourth finger is out. And my two fingers are curled up. And my thumb is up like that. Is that about right? Yeah. And my left hand, I kind of curl it like this. And my thumb is up. And how high is it? And is this kind of how, is this kind of how you're sitting? Is that fair? Chair. Is he not? He's sort of sitting on a sort of stool. Yeah. Yes. But he's the same back on the Yeah, we'll try it. Okay, take, take the rosemary half. 
and, and look at the picture and try and set yourself up like him and try and see what what is the difference, what can you, what can you do, what can't you do, what's missing. Okay. Bob, well, you're a kind of mirror image of Arthur O'Neill. So I want, I want you to do what Arthur O'Neill is doing. Well, look, these. I actually can't. So, I couldn't. With my hand, I can't accept your reason straight. So he's got the help on this side. Oh, of course. He's got his right hand yeah. right on his knee. Yeah, yeah, Stretch your force in your right. Yeah, yeah. Curl in middle two. Yeah. Lift your thumb. Yeah, yeah. Curl your fingers like that. Yeah, on this side. Yeah, lift your thumb. Okay. Is he looking at the string? What's he looking at? See if you can see the angle of his head or his face. Look at it, he's blind as well. So close your eyes. Okay. Do you think he's sitting upright or just, just twisting to one side? Or? He looks very upright. Yeah, so sit more upright, Bob. Yeah. More upright. Yeah. The heart goes to the face. Yeah. Or put your cheek against the side of the heart. Well, which side? That's oh! it. Because you see the other tackle very hard. Oh. No, the other side, Bob. That side, do you think? Yeah, otherwise you're a mirror image. This, this is quite a half. Yeah, so it's not exactly the same as this half. But no. it gives you an idea. Anyway, good. Next. That's the half of the next person. Can we all? I want us all to do this. So you say it's strange, but what, what's, why, so why do you find it strange? What are you comparing it to to make it seem strange? Um, for me it's strange for the left shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is my left hand, so now that it's over. Because yeah. okay. you're coming from a classical position. I, Okay, so, so you're well on the right hand side of that. Yeah. So, 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 so the whole point the whole point of the diagram of the two sides is that what's normal on one side is strange on the other side. Okay? That's fine. So I think finding it strange is perfectly normal. You know? If you went to Japan to learn Japanese court culture, at first it would seem very strange. But you would accept it as that's the way Japanese court culture works. And so this is my point. This is how I Irish heart works as far as we can see from the old guys. Okay, what's going on here? Can you see a bit better if I turn the... Okay, this is Dennis Hampson. And here's his heart in Genesis. And this is one of the manuscripts that you can study. Okay, so we can do exactly the same process with Dennis Hampson. Okay, so... Put then the most movies harps and write the downhill harps. And we have three of them, so we can go for it. We can run twice as fast. We can run half as fast again. So this is a little bit more complicated. He's sitting on a chair. You can see he's sitting on a chair. Here's the back of the chair. His chin is level with the top of the harp. He must have been quite small. He was a very small man. And what does this tell us about the downhill harp? 
the downhill harp is a very small harp. Okay, I think the downhill harp is a child's harp. Because it's so small. But what about the even smaller ones? The even smaller harps are nothing to do with our okay. contemporary tradition. Let's go back a couple of steps if we can. So, so we're here. Yeah. Okay, the, the much smaller harps come from up here. Okay. So, so they're, you know, they're, they're like, yeah. they're like looking at petal harp and then talking about medieval grey harp. Uh, they're, they're that okay. distance in time. Okay. So that's why I'm just, and we don't have to, you know, so, yeah, good question. So yeah, the downhill harp is very small. So you're going to struggle to play it sitting on a little chair. Although, so what could you do? Could you, do you think his chair was a bit small? Look at his knees. They, are they level? Yeah. You could sit on a slightly lower chair. A lot of people here are lifting their hearts up on little boxes. I, I can't cope with that. It's, it's, it's so dangerous because the harp can slip and fall, and I really don't like it. I think, and I think the harp's designed to sit, set on the floor, and I think they sound better set on the floor, and so I would always much rather think, perhaps we could put our bums lower down. So, Bob, for example, you could try and find one of his folding stools that's a little bit lower and put your bum on it. The purple one would be perfect for you. Astonishing, eh? So, un so look. Unfold the purple stool. Oh, the purple one. Try, try sitting on that. But I think if this is going to be the child's harp, then where are the ones that was? Well, the Rose Mooney. Because it could perfect size. Oh, okay. Right. So there's this whole model. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the downhill half is, is a small half. So, so Bob, look at the hapsi and position yourself like him. Yeah. Yeah. So you're about like chinned on the top of the half. So your left hand is a bit curled out, close to him. Yeah. And your right hand has got that slightly thumb under thing. And your fourth finger is a little bit stretched out. Your fourth finger. Yeah, you have to get my fourth finger thumb out. You get a free pass on that. But no, isn't he looking more like those have seen in his portraits? Do you want to look as as Do you see what I mean? Yeah, right, pass your half song. Pass your half song. Let the next person try this one. And you, have, you, have to, you have to stick with it. This is not easy. So, Ava, this is a good size half for you. Isn't it? I mean, can you put your chin on the top of it, okay? I'm more comfortable in the stand up piece. Well, when I play. play the, the hand in the middle. Can you, so, so we're trying to copy this picture. Yes, I could do it. Okay, so it's working. Yes. Put your chin on top, not at the side, because his chin is on top. Yeah. yeah but look, his shoulder is not to the left or to the right. No, well, 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 that's what I'm asking. Look, what he's, look at him. Well, he's got it ever so slightly to the left, but he's kind of turning his yeah. chin a bit to rest it on. Just like you're doing. Okay. So this is the, the aim of this exercise is to try and do what he's doing. Okay, just get an understanding of his practice. Okay. And so your right hand, you, you want this kind of shape. It's a little bit extended fourth finger, it's a small curled thumb. Okay. And then and the right hand, so so the, the, the right hand, the left hand a little bit more. Delicate. Not not as curled as I've been doing. Okay, you're looking at the wrong side. It doesn't have to be about looking oh, at the wrong side. And you might want to try Bob's stool because because you're a bit big for this half. So oh, okay. that's probably too small a stool. Oh, for you. So go go and try the half with that stool. Thank <laughs> you. 
So that so I think that's a good question who's playing that out. Yeah. Does this all make sense? Yeah. Are you all happy with this? Okay, what's going on here? Okay, this is Patrick Quinn. And there we have his, his notation of Burns' March, and there we have his heart, the Carson Otway heart in Trinity College. Okay. And so we have two Otway hearts here. So if we put our downhills down, we can do the same exercise with the Otway heart. So, take an Otway heart. So have a look at have a look at Quinn. Look, this look at his. Small. He's sitting very low, isn't he? So you need to find a low stool to sit on. Can I get a green stool, please? Here's a second half way up. Okay, so look at how quick. Oh, I think I'm sitting a bit low. Do you think you're sitting too low or is it about, about right? Yeah, because his, his cheek is pressed against the yeah. corner of the heart. Okay. Look at his knee. He's it's got the heart tucked right in. Okay, so he's got the, the heart is tucked right in, so it's so sitting forward. So it's too high now. I'm, I'm, I'm too low. I don't think. Because okay. look at me. Yeah, yeah. So it's a subtle thing. Try the purple stool. <laughs> Avery, you're way too high, actually, compared with twins. So you need, you need to try it sitting on the stool. Try the purple stool. Try this stool, it's a little bit higher. Because his legs are a bit. Um, his his left leg isn't stuck out in front of him at all. His left look, leg. look, his right leg. Yeah, but his left. His left leg is hidden, yeah. so he's like he's hooked it behind or something like that. That's hooked now because you can see the foot. Yeah, yeah, something like that. So. Yeah, that's looking good. And then he's got. Oh, he's got. Yeah. Oh, he's got. Does that make sense? It's actually really comfortable like this. Yeah. Like I'm comfortable. Well, he was a professional musician. He's not going to sit in an uncomfortable way. So you just need to work it out. Okay. And then this is an inspiration. This is how Patrick Quinn sits and plays. So you know, he's doing something like that. Anyway, pass the half on. Try the legs. Yeah, you need to swap places because the stalls are. It's an interesting one, this, that you think actually he's, he's obviously deliberately choosing that low stool to make it comfortable to play. So I think he's got the heart tucked in more, hasn't he? He's pulled the bottom of the heart in towards him. His right leg is extended, but his left leg is nowhere to be seen. His right hand is really low, it's on his thigh. His index finger is hooked right in, and his middle and especially his forehead is stretched out. And his left hand is curved. Yeah, that's good. Has, is, is his right hand really that drooping classical shape, or has he got a different shape for his right hand? It looks flatter to me, like more like this. So it's more like flat. Yeah, but not, not like it's in, just flat. Yeah, like a straight line from here, all the way back. But you're, you're still turning your palm towards the sideboard, and I don't think his hand is doing that at all. I think his palm is vertical like that, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. And is his elbow up or is it dropped? Is his elbow up or dropped? I've not been telling you what to do at all here. All I've been doing is showing you the pictures and asking if you would sit and try and copy what's in the picture. And I think this is an incredibly useful exercise that we can all do on an ongoing basis, is to get hold of these pictures and look at them really hard and to try and imitate them when we're sitting playing hard. <coughs> 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 
Because if our aim is to play in the old Irish heart tradition, then if, we, if we're doing it right, we should look like that. And if we don't look like that, why not? What are we doing wrong? So this is, this is, these are some ideas that I've had about how you connect to tradition, how, how, you, how you do this work of finding out where ideas come from. Okay? Any ideas that you or anyone else has about how to hold your heart, how to sit in your heart, any ideas you have that are not like that, where do they come from? Okay. And what I'm getting very suspicious that a lot of received ideas, a lot of the ideas that we have, come from here. Okay. And yet, it doesn't take much study. We've only been an hour, and we've already got new ideas that come from here that can change how we sit at the heart, how we hold ourselves. You see what I mean? We're, we're finding out things from here that contradict what we've received, because what we've received comes from here. And so, for me, I want to go, okay, I want to do it like that, because I want to be here, and I want to connect, I want a hook that goes up to there and pulls, pulls down. And I think this kind of study and copying of what we see in the pictures is one of those hooks that we've got there. <coughs> I want to be part of this. It's one of the hooks. There's lots of others. I was going to talk about archive recordings and listening, but we've got a time. You can talk about manuscripts in the other classes. The manuscripts are a massive hook. You can reach out to Bunting's manuscripts and pull them and get yourself there onto that column. But these pictures, the hand position, the posture, are a really important hook. Because other, otherwise, if you think about it, it's all about hooking the manuscripts down from there, and then you're hooking your hand position and the posture from over here. And that that's not as good. That's not getting you. It's not getting you into this corner. It's dragging you across to there. If you if you throw a hook that way and pull to get posture and hand position, you're not going to you're not going to get it over there. It's going to drag you in that direction. Okay? And you might be very happy being over there. Well, I'll be here. Anyway, it's too much. Thank you very much. Thank you.